Let me bring you greetings from your sister church over in Beverly. I am always thrilled every time I get a chance to be with you. And when Pastor Elijah called me last week, in fact, I didn't know Pastor Elijah would be here tonight. I think this is the first time that I've preached when Pastor Elijah was here. It's kind of intimidating. <laughs> no critiquing after. <laughs> Well, when he called me, we have this same dialogue we had that we always have. And I say something like this, well, pastor, what would you like me to preach on? Is there a text? Is there a topic? And then Elijah says what he always says. Oh, Gene, just preach as the Spirit leads you. I said, okay. And I hung up the phone. And unlike other times when this has happened, I instantly knew right away what I was going to preach on. I knew within five minutes. Usually it takes me a couple hours, right? It took me five minutes this time. And I decided to preach on a topic that affects everyone in the room. So what I'm going to preach on is for all of you. I thought that's a good one because I'm not talking about anything specific that some people may be struggling with and others not. This one affects everyone here. And tonight I want to talk about worship. And we're going to answer questions tonight like, is there a wrong way to worship God? Is there a right way to worship God? How do we know if we've worshiped God properly? How do we know if we have not worshiped God properly? So we're going to answer some of those questions tonight. Now, all of you are familiar with the Ten Commandments that are probably on the screen behind me. And the first commandment says, you shall have no other gods before me. And the second one, you should not make for yourself an idol. So I could propose to you the first commandment teaches us who God is. And the second commandment teaches us how to worship the one and only true God. Because I propose to you tonight, we must not only worship the right God, the true God, but we must worship him the right way. So that raises a question. Is there a wrong way to worship God? the true God. Well, instead of spending much time answering that question, let me just read a verse, or two verses from Scripture, and you can determine for yourself, is there a wrong way to worship God? I'm going to read from Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. And this is what they say. They say, Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, took their censers, put fire in them, and added incense. And they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. I think that's a pretty strong response to improper worship. Okay, can you worship God God the wrong way? You can answer that for yourself. I read a quote in preparation for this message that I didn't say this, I didn't make this up. It was someone else's quote, but I liked it. And this is what it says. It says, most middle-class Americans tend to worship their work, work at their play, and play at their worship. Now, I had to think about that for a little while to kind of take it in and think, is that something that I can say in my sermon that I believe is pretty accurate? After thinking about it for a day, I said, you know what, I'm going to put that in. Because I believe it is not true with everyone, but it is true with a lot of people. Let me explain what I mean by way of illustration. The story told of a young boy who lived around the turn of the century. And he lived out, way out in the country, and this boy had never seen a traveling circus before. But he heard one was coming to town on Saturday. So he asked his father, Hey, Dad, can I go to the circus on Saturday? And his father said, Sure, son, as long as your chores are done. Well, Saturday morning come, chores are done early, the little boy runs out to his father, and he asks him for some money so he can go to the circus. Well, Dad reaches into his overalls, and pulls out a brand new $1 bill and hands it to his son, the most money that boy had ever had in his hand in his entire life. 
He heads out to town. Well, as he approaches town, he sees people lining the street. And peering through the line, he gets a glimpse of the parade. There were animals in cages. There were marching bands. And at the end of the parade, there were clowns. And the little boy got so excited when the clowns walked by that he reached into his pocket and he handed them his $1 bill thinking he had seen the circus. But all he had seen was the parade. The little boy turned around and went home. He never saw the circus. Now, why do I tell you the story? I tell you the story because I believe some people come to church like the little boy who went to the circus. They come to church with the intent of worshiping God for sure, but all they see is the parade, the parade of singing, the parade of prayers, the parade of preaching, and they peer through their seats, and they see all the activity, and they go home, thinking they've worshiped God, but they've missed the main event, that being a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. Let me give you another story. This is from the page of history. This is true. 1977 is the year, and there is a woman in New Mexico who was frying tortillas when she noticed the skillet burns on one of her tortillas resembled the face of Jesus. You can see an actual picture of her tortilla behind me. And she was so excited about this, she ran and told her husband. She told the neighbors, and everyone agreed. The face etched on the tortilla was Jesus. So the woman waited a week or two, and she went to her priest because she wanted him to bless this tortilla. She testified to the priest the tortilla had changed her life. Well, the priest then interviewed her husband. And her husband told the priest the same thing. Since that tortilla, she's been more happy, she's been more peaceful since the tortilla arrived. And the priest said and reported that he was not accustomed to blessing tortillas. And the, police, uh, the, the priest said he was very reluctant to do it, but he agreed to do it anyways. Then the woman took the tortilla home, she put it in glass and put piles of cotton around it to make it look like the tortilla was floating on clouds, and she built a special altar for it. You can see it right there. That's what she built. And she opened a shrine to visitors. Well, the next 16 months, 36,000 people came to worship at the shrine of the Jesus of the tortilla. And many of them left flowers and candy and and prayer requests, and other kinds of gifts, and everyone agreed that the burn marks on the tortilla was the actual face of Jesus. So let me ask you a question. Did the experience and the actions of that woman in New Mexico and her tortilla, did it qualify as worship? What makes for real worship? How do you know when it's happened? How do you know when it hasn't happened? How do you know when God is pleased with your worship? And when can we say that God is not pleased with the way we are worshiping? Now, there are people, and I've run into them, would suggest that you and I have no right to make these kind of judgment calls. This is none of our business. Different strokes for different folks who we to question what another person thinks constitutes worship? It's an age-old dilemma. All right? Well, the answer to that dilemma is found in Scripture. Because Jesus encountered a woman one time who had some of the same questions. Pastor Alan, ready for us? It's in John chapter 4. And the encounter begins with Jesus walking through Samaria. And if you didn't know this, the people of Samaria and the people of Israel, they were enemies of each other. And the reason for that was simple, because both the Israelites and the Samaritans, they both thought that they were the true heirs of the covenant with Abraham. And each group thought only they worshipped God correctly. Jesus stops to get a drink from a well, and of course it wasn't just any ordinary well. 
It was a well that Jacob had built some 2,000 years earlier. He meets a woman there, begins a conversation with her. Now, this is for another sermon, I guess, but that alone is incredible. Because this woman had two strikes against her right away. She's a Samaritan, and she's a woman. In the midst of their conversation, it becomes apparent to this woman that Jesus is some kind of prophet. So what does she do? Well, she seizes the moment to ask this prophet a question that I'm guessing has bugged her for quite a while. And this is what she says in verses 19 and 20. Sir, the woman said, I can see you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. She basically is saying to Jesus, who's right? Are we right or are the Jews right? Listen to Jesus' answer. This is what he says. He says, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and now has come, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. What was Jesus saying? What does it mean to worship in spirit and truth? Contained in Jesus' words is the answer to that age-old question. Can we worship God sincerely and be completely wrong? All right? So I want to look at what Jesus said a little deeper. And I want us to understand what does it mean to worship God properly? What does it mean to worship God in spirit and in truth? Because Jesus' own words say those are the kind of worshipers that God desires. God desires us to worship him in spirit and truth. So what does it mean? Well, worship in spirit. This first one may seem like it's right on the surface, easy to do, but I'm going to throw a little wrench in that because it probably doesn't mean what you think. Jesus is not talking about you worship him in the power of the Holy Spirit. Zero. The reason I can say that definitively is because the word spirit here in the original language does not have a definite article. So it cannot be referring to the Holy Spirit. Cannot. So what is it referring to? All right. Well, Jesus is talking about our inner life when he has, says spirit, our emotions, our heart, our will. So to worship God in spirit is to connect with God, you could say, person to person. It's offering up ourselves to him in praise. And by the way, worship is never restricted to one form or one method, and yet expression is always a part of worship. Now let me explain what I mean by that. What we feel about God must be expressed. Think about this. A wife has a husband, and she is starved for his affection. She's starved for it. And she finally asks her husband, how come you never say you love me? And the husband says, what do you mean? I told you when we got married I love you, and if I change my mind, I'll let you know. Now, it's not very convincing, is it? Not very convincing at all. That's because true love needs to be expressed somehow, some way. Psalm 51.15 says, O Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. What we know that is true about God and what we feel in our hearts must be expressed somehow, some way. So how does this take place? Well, it takes place in the heart, not in a building. Verse 21, Jesus says this, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. It's not about a particular place or a particular time. 
This next statement is not intended to insult anyone, but I believe it's true. That unfortunately, some of the coldest, unmeaningful worship happens on Sunday morning in churches all over this country. I believe that. I believe that. In opposed to that, some of the most meaningful worship can take place in the strangest places, maybe like a prison cell in Philippi where Paul and Barnabas were being held prisoner. It's dangerous to think that we have to be in a church building to worship, as if picking up a songbook, saying a few prayers, listening to a sermon automatically means you've worshipped. No. No, not at all. No insult to Pastor Elijah, but he knows this. This building is not magical. Okay? You don't magically walk in and all of a sudden you worship God. No. Absolutely not. Now, this building may facilitate worship. It may aid us in our worship, but so may your living room or your bedroom. It does not make what we do any more worshipful any more than maybe a movie theater or a ball field or our own homes. All right, I hope you understand that. There's no one way to worship God. There's no one way to express your worship of God. It's not one style of music. It's not one particular instrument. It's not one particular posture of your body. And the Bible is filled with expressions of worship. Some people composed song, songs and sang songs, like Miriam, after God delivered the Hebrew nation across the Red Sea, or Mary, after she'd been visited by the news of her miraculous pregnancy, or David, he danced before the Lord in front of a lot of other people, when God made Israel victorious in bringing the Ark of the Covenant back home. In fact, David's wife, we're told, was upset that he had danced before the Lord and other people, thinking that he had embarrassed himself, and it was undignified and silly. And you know what? David didn't care, because David was dancing for God. All right, And the audience was God. It wasn't the people around him. Wise men, they made a spiritual pilgrimage and made an offering of gifts at the birth of Christ as their way of worshiping. Peter and John, when they healed a lame man, in the name of Jesus, he went around walking and leaping and praising God in the temple. Paul and Timothy, they wanted men everywhere, we're told, to raise their hands in prayer. Mary, a friend of Jesus, broke a vase of expensive perfume over his feet, washed it with her hair. In fact, that got some people upset and thought that was not a proper way to worship God. This list could go on and on and on according to Scripture. You see, each mode of expression, what was happening was something that started in the heart and led to some kind of physical expression. The expression itself is never the key. It's what's going on in the heart. You know, on Sunday morning over at Beverly, there are times, kind of like today, I guess, that there are some songs that we sing that I just, at some point, will raise my hand. Maybe sometimes even two hands in worship, okay? Now, I don't go into the service saying, well, on the third verse or the second song, I'm going to raise my hand. No, that's silly. It's a knee-jerk reaction about from the awe of God, and it's my expression of my love for him. Okay, it's an expression. Now, if you don't raise your hand, don't come here next week or Sunday and think, i got to raise my hand because that guy from Beverly said, you need to do that. No, I'm not saying to do that. I'm saying do whatever you feel God is impressing you to do. Okay? Because oftentimes your reaction to worship is a knee-jerk reaction because it's a response from some kind of awe in your heart. You just couldn't help it. Let me tell you a t- true story. This happened in Kansas City. Explains what I mean here. It's a woman. She entered haagen ice cream store. I like haagen ice cream. And she bought an ice cream cone. And after making her selection and ordering her cone before she actually got it, she turned around and standing right behind her, she became face-to-face with Paul Newman. Now, Paul Newman, he was shooting a movie in town. And Paul Newman was her greatest actor she'd ever seen in her life. She was just stunned. She couldn't talk. Her heart started racing, and she didn't know what to do. So she turned back around, paid for her ice cream cone, and left. And when she got outside, she realized she didn't have her ice cream cone. 
So she walks back in. Paul Newman's opening the door. He's walking out. There they are face to face again, and she is stunned. And he says to her, are you looking for your ice cream cone? And she just shakes, can't talk. And he says, well, ma'am, you put it in your purse with your change. <laughs> she was awestruck, all right? Now, when's the last time that the presence of God quickened your pulse like that? When's the last time? God desires anyone who will worship him in spirit. But he also desires that we worship him in truth, all right? And what's this truth thing all about? Well, I'm going to give you a couple of things that it's about. There may be more. That's fine. But worship and truth means accuracy. It's not just having your own idea about God. It's, just, it's not just having what you like God to be like. But it's honestly searching his word to find out who he is and what he has done. As creator, ruler, redeemer, savior. That's where the Samaritans got it completely wrong. Jesus said, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. See, they were sincere in their worship, the Samaritans, but they had bad information about God to base it on. They weren't worshiping in truth. And by the way, sincerity alone is never enough for acceptable worship. Now, the Jewish leaders, by the way, in Jesus' day, they had the other problem. They, they, they had a problem, too. They had the complete opposite problem. They had the truth about God, but they often lacked a sincerity of heart. They both were critical for worship that God desires from us. Now, the person who makes a shrine to the Jesus of the tortilla, they were missing something. They were missing the truth. But the person who can quote the Bible backwards and forward and can expound on the nature of God and feels nothing that moves them to express their love to God, they've missed something just as critical. And that leads to the second inference about worshiping in truth. Love and truth involves authenticity. It is not hypocritical. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says that we are to give God our lives as our spiritual act of service. And worship, I think you've got it at this point, is not only confined to one place, one time, like Sunday morning or Wednesday evening church. Worship is a lifestyle. You know, it happens here, but it also should happen as you go out the door. When I close my prayers at Beverly almost every week, I say, God, help us to continue to worship you throughout the week. It should, our worship of God doesn't change when we leave here. Or let me say this, it shouldn't change when we leave here. Worship happens when we live out what we believe. Worship happens when you're careful with your language you use at work or with your friends. Worship is happening when you take time to visit a lonely person. Worship happens when you share a little bit of your faith with someone. Worship happens when you decide not to watch a movie that mocks a pure lifestyle. Worship happens whenever you present your bodies as living sacrifice to God because of who he is and because of what he has done. That's why the greatest commandment is, you know what it is, right? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. That is worshiping in spirit and in truth. When we really worship God as he desires, I believe at least four things are going to happen. I call them the four E's of worship. First, exalting is going to happen. God will be glorified and God will be adored. Secondly, exemplifying is going to happen because we as believers become more like Christ. We get purified. Edifying is going to happen because the church body is going to be built up. It only makes sense because as individuals, as we draw near to God, we draw nearer to each other as well. It makes total sense. And evangelism happens because when people see you genuinely worship God in your daily life and corporately as well, they'll want to know 
the God and Savior that you serve and how he changed your life. Friends, let's strive to be known as people who worship God in spirit and in truth. Jesus tells us that's what God desires, and don't think that's automatic. Don't think because you go to church it automatically happens. Remember the little story of the boy of the parade? He thought he had seen the circus, and all he had seen is the parade. And when you come to church, you can just see the parade and miss the main event, which is a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. And I think that's what we all desire, because I think that's why you're here tonight. You're on a Wednesday night, no less. Praise the Lord for Wednesday night service. I haven't preached in a Wednesday night service in over 30 years. They don't exist anymore, you know, but Elijah did it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how he did it. You know, I would try it, but, you know, I'm leaving in a couple of months, so I'm, I'm not going to try it now, Beverly. Maybe the new person will try it. Um, so praise the Lord. All right, so that's the message, worship. We come here to worship, but when we go home, we worship. When we go to work, we worship. When we go to the grocery store, we worship. When we get gas for our car, we worship. We should be worshiping God by our actions everywhere we go. So don't wait till Sunday morning or Wednesday evening to get your quota of worship in. No, that's not what Jesus wants. That's not what God wants. He wants all of his children to worship him in spirit and truth. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, God, for your word. I thank you for Jesus' teaching to this Samaritan woman. And we can know for certainty what you consider appropriate worship what will please you, God, and what will change us. And I pray for Danvers Nazarene Church. And I pray, God, that as they come together twice a week for corporate worship, Father, that their lives would be enhanced, that they would become more and more like Christ. And then when we leave this place, God, they'll be more and more pliable to be used by you, to share your love, to give testimony about who you are. And in doing that, God, their friends, co-workers, neighbors, family members, that everyone they come in contact with will know that they're a Christian, will know that they're a child of the King, Father, and they'll have opportunity to accept Him as Lord and Savior. So I pray, God, for much fruit to be produced here at Danvers, God, and that they would change this community for Christ. I pray also, God, for Elijah and his healing. I'm glad he's here tonight, Father. I pray that you would bring him to complete health, and at this operation, I thank you for the doctors who performed it. And I pray it would lead to complete healing, God. And I pray that it would happen quicker than they would expect, Father. So I give you, my friend, Pastor Elijah, I give you this church, God. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>